to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas. It must be Friday at 3 p.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. Today for an energetic debrief <laughs> is the very dynamic director of Hawaii's Sierra Club, Marty Townsend. And the Sierra Club of Hawaii worked really hard to um, raise awareness around a meeting that happened last night. It was great at um, Moana Lua Middle School. And did you go to Moana Lua Middle School? I went to Moana High School. High I school. I went to okay. A and Intermediate. Okay. Well, <laughs> you still right. get bragging rights. Thanks. <laughs> go <Gold> Mighty Manys. <laughs> And it turns out that's actually a really great place to have a meeting. Who would have thought? Yeah. And this is the second one. What I, um, the first one that that was just a Sierra Club meeting about a month ago. Mm -hmm. So so there's been a series of meetings. So um, uh, there was a you know 27,000 gallon leak of fuel in January 2014. Um, since then, there have been a series of public meetings um, with the. Navy, Environmental Protection Agency, and Department of Health, um, uh, as well as the Board of Water Supply and the Sierra Club. So, um, let's see, there were meetings in June of 2015 and then in October um, that were both hosted by the Navy um, with the EPA and Department of Health. Um, in June of 2016, uh, the Board of Water Supply hosted a meeting. And in August of 2015, 2016, um, the Sierra Club hosted a meeting. And all of these were geared towards um, trying to get more um, understanding about um, the agreement that was reached between the Navy, the EPA, and the Department of Health for addressing the jet fuel storage facility at Red Hill. Um, this facility is ginormous. Um, it's holding uh, their 15 tanks out of 20 are in operation, um, each holding 12.5 million gallons of fuel, um, 100 feet above our drinking water aquifer. And while currently our drinking water is not contaminated, the concern is is that the history of leaks uh, at this facility um, are just a warning sign, a signal that um, we could seriously jeopardize the quality of our water if anything significant and serious happened. Um, so last night we had a meeting uh, that was supposed to be the one-year anniversary um, check-in of um, with the Navy, EPA, and Department of Health, and uh, yeah, it was a very good turnout. Um, I think people were probably not fully satisfied with the answers to their questions, um, but I, you know, we as a whole are heartened to see that people are engaged and concerned about this issue. I mean, that is a prerequisite to ensuring that our water is protected. Um, we are grateful to have um, someone like um, Ernest Lau at the Board of Water Supply to oh, provide- he was wonderful. To provide information and context and perspective and expertise in this area. Um, we were grateful to the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Health. Uh, they actually rejected um, the Navy's current proposal for their, their work plan for Red Hill um, because it's just basically inadequate. And um, I think that has helped to, to build some public confidence that we're going to ultimately end up with a plan that protects Red Hill, hopefully, um, or protects our water supply. Um, but the concern is, is that it's just taking way too long. I mean, here we are where the spill, the last spill happened in 2014. Here we are on October 2016, and we're still talking about scoping at this point. Like, we have had very little action, if any. They've installed a few new monitoring wells, which is great, but there's been no cleanup. They haven't made any effort to identify where the fuel is that is spilled, um, and they don't have any plans for figuring out how to clean it up, and that's just, just not acceptable. There is, um, it used to be a, um, a EPA Superfund up there that they supposedly handled uh, back in the 80s, I guess. Uh, but um, I, I want to, I loved the um, analogy that uh, Ernie did on, you know, how much fuel this really is. Oh, yeah. He talked about Aloha Stadium. Yeah. If you go goal line to goal line, sideline to sideline, yeah. that one million gallons is three feet yeah. deep. And that, so that whole facility would be 
that football field more than 500 feet tall, which is more than the first Hawaiian Bank building downtown. Yeah. So worth that, of to fuel, me, sitting, worth of sitting fuel. above the groundwater. <laughs> right. I thought that was fabulous because yeah. it's just, it's so huge. It's kind of hard to take in, mm -hmm. you know, like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the concern really is is that uh, we don't see the urgency needed to ensure that we aren't on the cusp of a major catastrophe. These tanks are 70 years old. I mean, I mean like put it into context, these, these tanks were installed in 1940s. Um, this is 1940s steel that has been corroding. It has no protection against corrosion. Um, there is no tank with inside of a tank um, construction, which is what is standard now. And as you know, one of the speakers, Representative Thielen, pointed out, um, if proposed today, these tanks would not be allowed to be built. You can't. You would not be able to do uh, what they did to our uh, Red Hill um, today. And the fact that they are trying to get this facility to continue indefinitely um, it may not be a reasonable expectation. There were a lot of, uh, in addition to Representative Thielen's and Senator Thielen's, yep. there were a lot, there were a lot of um, public officials there. Can mm -hmm. you want to do a little, um, so uh, I was So, so yeah, it's both um, Representative Thielen and um, Senator uh, Laura Thielen. Um, there was also council members, council member Fukunaga, council member uh, Brian Elefante. Uh, you had um, senators, like Senator Wakai was there, um, uh, Senator Nishihara, um, Senator Green Haribodo. Haribodo. Yeah. yeah. And you had representatives there, yeah, Representative Ichiyama, uh, Representative um, Aaron Johansson. Uh, so the area elected officials, as well as elected officials not from the area, I mean, Gil Riviere was there too. Um, they recognized the importance of this issue. And I really appreciated that a majority of them stayed till the end. Like they sat there and listened to all the information that was given. Um, they heard the questions, they were taking notes, they participated in the process and asked their own questions. Uh, I think that really demonstrates um, a commitment to this issue that you don't see in other situations and it was, it was really heartening. And you said that you got, um, or the, that um, also Tulsi Gabbard um, oh, has no. expressed her, yes. she wasn't at the meeting, but. Actually she did come to the meeting for a short period, but um, we, uh, you know, she tried to, you know, see if there's an opportunity to ask her own questions, but um, they had already taken away the sign-in sheet and uh, it was late in the evening, but she did come in um, and, you know, look at all the materials and, uh, you know, talk to some of the uh, community leaders who are concerned about this issue. Um, so, yeah, so, and Representative Gadaver has been an early um, advocate for, you know, the precautionary principle and taking the most protective approaches to the the management of this Red Hill the fuel facility. So um, we really appreciate her leadership on this issue. So it, it, it felt like um, there was um, a, a really healthy mix of uh, elected officials and area representatives. I'm just taking this kind of from uh, the, the questions who, who ask questions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of the core activist environmentalist groups, um, which are always uh, so wonderful and keep, keep <laughs> Keep people honest around here, <laughs> or do their best. <laughs> we try. Yeah. So um, the the issues around um, the the things that don't work that was section six and seven that they got into they got into that a, a little bit, um, but it was interesting to me that they they took uh, they being the U.S. Navy took um, a lot of time to explain what went wrong for that one incident in 2014 that you talked about, the tank number five, the infamous tank number five, yeah, which had just been fixed yeah. and then leaked. And, then and they totally blame it on the contractor. The, the, the contractor did poor welding and you know, the, the only responsibility the Navy um, seems willing to accept is that they didn't uh, look over that contractor's shoulder enough. Um, but, you know, the, they're, I mean, I question whether this is a doable job. Like, you gave the contractor this job to keep this 70-year-old tank from leaking. Um, and maybe that's not possible. I mean, the, you have to think about it. Like, uh, the, you know, when I think back to 2014, and you know, as information was coming out about the spill, it was like, well, there's five holes. We looked again. There's 15 holes. Okay, now we're finding like 70 anomalies. Like, you know, it, it came out that there was actually quite a bit wrong with that tank. And um, 
there are a, you know five other tanks, maybe more, that haven't been recently inspected. And I mean, that's the problem: is that these small chronic leaks um, uh, are hard to detect, and uh, we don't, you know, the the thing. And once you detect them, that means they're already in the environment, so it's too late. Like what we really want is a leak-proof system, and that's like the basic minimum expectation. So you asked uh, about the the double lining the tanks, and mm, you you didn't get. Too, too, <laughs> too much of a straight answer on that one. Yeah, so um, if you were to um, install an underground storage tank for fuel today, um, the requirement is um, what's called tank in a tank construction, double walling. And the intent behind that is to prevent the uh, fuel being stored uh, from getting out into the environment, um, which you know, serves really. both interests, right. Um, and uh, but these tanks built in the 1940s, um, built in the field, like field constructed. So I mean, just so people understand what that means, it means they dug a gigantic hole. God knows blasted. what they pulled it. Yeah, blasted. blasted. The, which uh. means that the rock under the basalt underneath yes. it has has fractured. Right. Then they poured concrete in, and then they welded little squares of steel all the way around the inside of it. And uh, surprise, surprise, 70 years later, the steel is starting to give corrosion um, over time. Um, it's irreversible, you can't, and you can't stop it. And, uh, and that's the situation that, that we're confronting. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, it's just, uh, we want to make sure that um, double wall construction is, is, is fully analyzed. At this point, at this stage in the process, they have not fully analyzed the option of uh, double wall construction. Um, and they haven't analyzed the option of relocating the fuel storage facility to some other place. And they need to look at both of those alternatives um, to be able to really make an informed decision. The other interesting thing that we learned from last night's meeting was that, according to the Navy, money is no object. It doesn't matter how much it costs, they are going to make it happen. And I think we should hold them to that. I don't want to hear that uh, this is too expensive is the reason why they aren't going to ensure that these tanks don't leak. Where the one place I did hear the money come into play was when, um, uh, and we'll do a vid video of it later, they were asked about, oh, um, Gary Gill said, well, what if you don't use all the tanks? Mm -hmm. You know, and then they gave that, well, we'll show that clip later. But they said that they're um, about uh, uh, they're about to spend thirty five million dollars on refurbishing the five tank the five tanks that haven't been refurbished in a while. Yeah, I think they're focusing. But yeah, yeah. They yeah. didn't mention that some of them hadn't ever hadn't ever been in seventy three years. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Um, you know, let's just take a little break right now, and okay. then we'll come back and watch that video and and talk some more. Okay, that's good. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kelly Lucas, and with me today is Marty Townsend of Hawaii Sierra Club. And last night we were at the uh, Moanalua Middle School where there was a meeting on the Red Hill fuel tanks. And to give you a, a, a taste of what that meeting was like, we have a, a clip from the uh, question and answer session that happened after the presentation. I think people are here concerned about the risk. Even if we hear that the water is safe today, what about tomorrow? What about this catastrophic The only way to reduce that risk to zero is to do away with the Well, so we have a question. Let's ask a question. Um, we have two minutes to get to my question. There are, there are, there are questions here. Okay. Short of reducing that risk to zero, the, the, the 
game here really is how do you reduce it to as much as is feasible or practical. We could cut the risk in half if we were to reduce the number of tanks currently holding fuel in half. Currently, there are 20 tanks. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe there are 15 that are filled. Going by your own analysis, what I heard that five of those 15 have actually been upgraded. That means 10 tanks are filled now that have not been upgraded. So that's a big risk. Question? To reduce the risk, can the Navy reduce the number of tanks that are currently filled with gas? Second point tied into that, timing, risk timing. One thing people are concerned about is it takes 20 years to get to this end of the AOC system. What about 10 years? If we reduce the number of tanks in service by half, we can cut 20 years to 10. That would, as a suggestion, I'd like you to read. Consider. And as to trust, can we trust the results of all the contractors and everybody? Oversight, transparency is important. Can we, as we take these samples from the monitoring wells, take a split sample, have the Navy test it, have the EPA and the DOH test it, and let the Board of Water Supply test it? Okay, so we've got a triple header there, so I'm going to take at least one and a half of these and I'll give Rich Hayes the other one. So the question was, simple math, you have, you cut the capacity in half, you cut the risk in half, assuming that the risk to failure ratio is on a clear linear path, and we won't discuss that piece of it, we'll just assume that you can do that. Uh, and it makes sense logically, uh, but the question is, and I talked about this earlier, there is a reason why Red Hill is here, and why we have the amount of stuff in there. It is not an arbitrary amount of petroleum. Now, I can't talk to specifics because that is classified, but what I can say is we do not arbitrarily have fuel in the mountain, and I will tell you this, we are certainly not hoarding fuel in the mountain just to have it there. So, yes, we could cut the risk in half, if we cut half of the capacity out mathematically, but the, but the question is, but the, but the concern is, we have to determine from a bigger perspective what we need to have here for Red Hill to exist. Because at some point, the reason for existing and the risk mitigation will counteract each other. So that's why I talked about this earlier. Part of the process here, and this is above, I mean, this is above us here from the Navy perspective, is the wide Red Hill how much it takes to do that. Okay, so I don't want to confuse anyone here on this. So that there is a reason for it, and we have the amount of fuel in the mountain based on the reasons that I laid out. So if we were just to arbitrarily cut that in half, the question would be, would Red Hill still serve the purpose that it's intended to do because it's here? So I wanted to add a little bit to that and um, give a little of my perspective. We're studying the risk posed by Red Hill. I'm not sure if reducing the number of tanks in half would reduce risk in half. I think the answer is probably not. So as you can see, it was, it was a lively bunch and, a, and an animated discourse. So at some point, there is a, a, a point of diminishing returns for the Navy, um, but we didn't, they were very cagey about what that point was. Um, mm. Well, I'll tell you, the point of diminishing return for me as a water drinker is uh, <laughs> when they leak, when the tanks leak again. Um, what we've learned from the Navy's re publishing of reports, the historic leak um, information, that since the tanks were built, there have been 40 leaks. Um, and not, as far as we can tell, none of it has been cleaned up. Um, it's not so much that the 40 leaks are a sign that our water is contaminated, but more that this is a chronic, long-standing problem. Which they did not, um, they, they contradicted. I mean, that, they, I, said, they, tried to, they tried to be transparent and talked much to that subject, but and I, it was good that they are opening themselves to this process, but the guy said, uh, 
a one event. And I was I like, know, he said there's been two, two weeks. And then when I asked him about it, and then he said two, and the other one was only six gallons. <laughs> yeah, since 1988. But, uh, you know, yeah. you look at the entire history of the facility, um, and this is only reported leaks. Um, you know, there's other, yeah, you know, really evidence, point. like, that circumstantial evidence that indicates there could have been other leaks, you know, as we see spikes in monitoring data, for example. So well, the cores. The, right, the, the core, core samples. samples that show that there have been leaks um, on a, from every, all of the 20 tanks. So um, I think it's just, it's bad public policy to store your fuel uh, 100 feet above your drinking water. <laughs> and it's in the na as much as in the Navy's interest to ensure that they don't lose fuel um, as it is in you know, humanity's interest to ensure that we don't lose water. And if the Navy really you know, considers this place to be strategic and plans to use it into, you know, indefinitely into the future because of the Pacific pivot, um, then they need to invest in it and make it top notch you know, 21st century technology technology. And if they can't afford that, then they need to retire these tanks and store the fuel elsewhere. I, I, I just, just common sense is you, do, you don't do this. And, don't and do this. Uh, I, I think it's very gracious of you to give them a, <laughs> uh, an, an out on this. But I, I actually, I, I think it's unconscionable and it, there's, there's, no, there's no reason for yeah. this. And, and I think the a rejection letter that the Navy got um, just further demonstrates that um, the Navy's approach to Red Hill is is insufficient, and you know the unified uh, position that you see coming from regulators, uh, from the community, and from elected officials is that the status quo at Red Hill is not acceptable. You have to fundamentally change what's happening there in order to proceed. And the first thing first on my list is to clean up the spill that's already out there. Um, and then from there, they really need to get very good at understanding the uh, soil uh, around the tanks. They also need to be able to understand the flow of water. Um, we don't know exactly where the water goes uh, underground, and there's no way you can model uh, w you know, the what you don't know. Yeah, you can't model what you don't know. The likelihood of contamination is unknown, and, and the EPA's rejection letter basically said that the, uh, the Navy's relying on assumptions and speculation to you know, assess the risk of the jet fuel being stored here, and uh, we need some far more definite than assumptions and speculation. They were um, pretty good at playing um, to the audience in, 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 <laughs> in some regards. Um, I thought there was amusing. Somebody asked, you know, how many days of fuel would it, um, would that fuel storage facility provide Oahu in the case of a disaster? And I thought, oh, that's such a sweet question. As if they would. Yeah, that, <laughs> it's jet fuel. It's not like we're driving our cars with it. Yeah. It's not going to serve the residents of Oahu. But they didn't mention that. No, they did not mention that. Yeah, they, they, they totally went, well, you and I could sit down for an hour and we could figure that out, theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, ooh. Yeah. OK. Um, I did hear one positive thing in a private conversation. Oh. Um, uh, uh, man from the Defense Logistics Agency mm -hmm. said, I said, I specifically asked about the alternatives. They had in, the, they, in this information corral, so when you walked into the cafeteria, there was a large open space, and around the space were these um, uh, posters, poster boards. Yeah. Poster boards. And um, it was a very interesting way of organizing a meeting. Um, uh, and one of the poster boards was on alternative sites. And so I asked him, so, so what it, and that poster board had all these things like it had to be off the grid, um, gravity fed, and all of this stuff. And I said, well, well, who made that list? And he said, well, those are just things that the present facility has that we like, sort of. Okay. The, 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 the capacity, mm -hmm. the fact that the, they don't have to use energy to access the fuel because it's gravity fed, it can just come down. I said, yeah, but you got to pump it up there. <laughs> that takes energy. <laughs> detail. Uh, detail. Anyway, um, but I did like the idea that they were talking off the grid <laughs> for a fuel. St anyway, so there were all these, um, these amusing um, anecdotes. But what he said that was very interesting was that, that um, Board of Water Supply, EPA, uh, Department of Health, <clears throat> other stakeholders, 
are the ones who are invited to make the list of their wish list on alternative sites. Mm. And that is one of the steps, that's step number eight. So we have six and seven have been rejected. Um, but that, it, that is in uh, step number eight. And I said, well, do we have to wait till six and seven have been hashed out? And he said, no, that they're, all, they're going forward on all of them. So mm -hmm. that is a really good thing. I yeah. thought, okay, and so let's, let's be thinking. Let's yeah. make our wish list. And, and one of the things the EPA made a point of saying last night is that they are open to our comments 24-7, and I quote. And so I encourage everyone to email uh, the EPA directly with their wish list for uh, this facility. Uh, their email address is redhill, R-E-D-H-I-L-L, -L, at epa.gov, E-P-A dot G-O-V. And uh, yeah, I think we just need to take them up on the invitation and let them know uh, what our minimum expectations are. For me, and for the Sierra Club, it's that these tanks will never leak again, um, and that all of that fuel that's been released is cleaned up. If you can't meet those minimum requirements, then we're not even going to be talking about continuing uh, to store fuel there. Um, I mean, this, we, their strategic um, necessity and advantage um, cannot trump the safety of our water. And bottom that's the, line. And that's that the bottom is the line. bottom line. Yeah. And it really would make a, a wonderful World War II memorial and historic site. That was my <laughs> <laughs> my little contribution last night. Uh, it didn't come off quite the way I wanted to. But the, the, the point is that it, it really could be a win for them, the site. And um, it is, an, it's one of the nine engineering marvels of the world. And um, there's yeah. all kinds of, of wonderful things about it, except it shouldn't be holding I think, you know, uh, there is a point at which you get diminishing returns on relying on technology. And as amazing of an engineering feat as the Red Hill tanks might be, we saw last night at the meeting what happens when you over-rely on technology that isn't fully tested. I mean, the Navy itself had spent all of this time and effort on some kind of propaganda video and really wanted the group to see it. And we wasted a good 10 minutes uh, trying to get them to show it. And uh, the technology between the Wi-Fi connection and the DVD, it just didn't come off at all, and they had to apologize profusely. And you know, in this situation, it's okay to apologize for wasting our time, but you know, it's not okay to apologize for contaminating our water. That's a brilliant example, Marty, because they had, I'm not sure how many people um, on their team in the room, and the guy said, okay, so who has the disc? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Marty. <laughs> this story will be uh, continuing. Yes, and yes. So um, we're hoping that the uh, the EPA will transition to quarterly meetings on this issue. Um, I think what we learned last night also is that an annual check-in is definitely not enough. Um, people have a lot to say and they have a lot of questions and we need to have more engagement. All right. Keep on it, Marty. Thank you. Aloha.